Now that we've talked about how to get to Mars and how we actually should land on the surface, I'm going to talk about what it would actually be like to stand on the surface. I've got a few questions for you first, and if you were listening really carefully, you might have the answers already. First, what do we think the gravity is like on Mars? Uh, you've probably all seen pictures of astronauts on the Moon. They're bouncing around a lot because the gravity on the Moon is a lot less than it is on Earth because the Moon is a lot smaller than the Earth is. So when we're talking about astronauts walking around on the surface of Mars, do you think they would feel heavy or do you think they would feel light? Yes, Mars is smaller than Earth, so the gravity on Mars is less than it is on Earth. It's about a third of Earth's gravity, so you wouldn't be bouncing around as much as they do on the Moon, but you would be able to make some big jumps quite easily. Next, the temperature on Mars. And I'm talking about average temperature because just like on Earth, if you're looking at any point on Mars, the temperature will vary a lot through the length of a day. It'll vary a lot through seasons, and it'll vary depending on whether you're standing on the equator or at the poles. But on average, what do we think? It is, in general, quite cold. I've got a couple of temperatures there. The uh, maximum you'll find on the surface is 27 degrees, and that's not actually a bad temperature for humans walking around, but you'll only get that at certain points on the surface at certain times of the year. Minimum temperatures you might find would be about minus 132, so that's not really hospitable for human life. Given that I've said that, do you think you need sunscreen? Would you need protection from the sun if you were just walking around on the surface? Yes, you do need sunscreen. Uh, the sun is further away from Mars, or Mars is further away from the sun, so the temperature from the sun will be uh, a lot less. But as Stephen mentioned earlier, the atmosphere is that much thinner, and Mars doesn't have the magnetic field that we do on Earth. So on Earth, the atmosphere and the magnetic field protect us from radiation from space, and especially UV radiation from the sun. Without that protective field and without the atmosphere, you would experience a lot of radiation from the sun on Mars, so you would need to cover up. Finally, do you think you can breathe? Apart from the atmosphere being that much thinner, it's also, as Stephen did mention, made almost entirely of carbon dioxide, which we can't breathe. So if you're walking around on the surface, you would need some sort of protective suit to keep you alive. So has anyone seen the film The Martian or read the book? Yep. Excellent. I would recommend it. I think as Hollywood does science, this is a really good one, and it's a pretty good representation of what the conditions on the surface of Mars might be like for human astronauts. They didn't get it completely right. Uh, this one thing, it's not a big spoiler because it happens fairly early on. At one point, the astronaut on Mars gets picked up by a dust storm and blown away from his teammates. That wouldn't actually happen. The, the winds on Mars do get quite fast, but the atmosphere being so thin, they don't have a lot of force, so you couldn't get carried away by them. But the storms are there. As Stephen said, they get very large. You can see some scale bars here. These were all images taken from orbit. So we're talking about storms that are hundreds of kilometers wide, frequently reaching the size of France. They're really big weather patterns. One of the biggest weather systems that you would experience if you were standing on the surface of the planet. The one in the middle there, we've got a nice swirling pattern as it comes down off the North Pole. Very exciting. You can see them from Earth, and you can see them really nicely from orbit. So, what would the weather actually be like if we were standing on Mars then? I have put together a weather forecast for today on Mars. Uh, you can see we had highs in the afternoon of about 16 degrees. This would be if you're standing on the equator, so it's not like this all over the surface. Uh, I think that's actually a bit warmer than we had here in Belfast today. But overnight, we're looking at negative figures down to minus 81. So you can see there's a large range of temperature across the day. And this is not just made up. This is actually what I think it really would have been like on Mars today. So how do I know that? It's all about the missions that we sent there. As Stephen said, a lot of them have been successful over the years. We've got a lot of orbiters who have been around the surface, or been around the planet, and a lot of landers and rovers have made it to the surface now. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of the successful missions, but I'm just going to give you a little synopsis of some of the more recent ones and talk about what they've shown us while they've been there. I'm going to talk about Spirit, Opportunity, Phoenix, and Curiosity. So first up, we have uh, Spirit and Opportunity, or Spirit and Opportunity, because they were identical rovers. They were launched and they landed on surface in 2004, went to opposite sides of the planet, and were very successful, I have to say. Is anyone in the audience age 13 or younger? Stick your hands up. I think we've got a few of you. Yep. OK. Uh, Opportunity landed in 2004 and is still driving around today. So there has been a, a rover driving around on the surface of Mars for the entirety of your lives. Uh, Spirit didn't quite make it that far. Spirit made it uh, to six years. But given that both of these rovers were only expected to last about three months, I think they did pretty well. And Opportunity is still sending back to science today and has now driven the length of a marathon on the surface of Mars. 
So what have they seen? Well, Opportunity has sent back some lovely pictures. This is just a snapshot of an entire 360-degree panorama that it sent back. And these pictures are all online. You can search for them. It's a wonderful collection that NASA have got. In this shot alone, you can see lots of different types of terrain. You can see some rocks there. You can see some of the, uh, the dust that Vikings saw, but we got better pictures because we got newer cameras. In this particular image, you can see the tracks that Opportunity actually made in the dust on the surface. And because it's a rover, it's not just able to take pictures at one spot, it's able to drive around and take pictures of lots of different types of terrain. So we get a lot of science back just from images like this. I mentioned dust storms. This might be what it's like to be in a dust storm. That slice over the far side is a picture that Opportunity, Opportunity took looking out over Mars when there's no dust storm around. And then the, progressively, the slice is taken over a number of days when a really slow moving dust storm started to overtake the position of Opportunity. Now, the rover can't overrun, outrun these sort of storms, so it's just got to weather its way through them. And these sort of storms could be a bit dangerous for our rovers. It's not going to pick them up and carry them away, but you can see the sky gets really dark as the storm gets thicker. Now, these panels here are solar panels. Opportunity and Spirit are solar powered. So if the sky gets too dark, the light from the sun simply doesn't reach those solar panels, which means the rover can't charge up, it can't drive anywhere, it, where it can't talk back to us, and eventually it would not even be able to receive our signals. So these sort of storms could be an issue for landers on the, on the surface. Luckily, they haven't been so far. Opportunity still carries on. And one of the other weather patterns it's seen on the surface is a dust devil. Now, this is much smaller than a dust storm. This feature is probably only a few metres wide. It's not very far away. There's a a set of still images that have been put together into a little video here. Dust devils are little spinning vortices of air which lift dust from the surface and move along, and we see a lot of these across the surface of Mars. And whereas dust storms might be a bit dangerous for the lander, we think that maybe dust devils might actually be helpful. When the dust from the storm settles on top of the solar panels, which could be a risk, we believe that sometimes these dust devils come along near the rover and lift dust back off the panels, so giving the rover a new lease of life. So they could be quite helpful to us. After Spirit and Opportunity, we have Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix was not a rover, it's a lander, so it only went to one point. It landed in 2008 near the North Pole of Mars. Most of the landers we sent, the Viking landers and Spirit and Opportunity, were fairly equatorial. We hadn't sent anything to the pole yet, so NASA sent something up there. You can see on the front here, this little lander has got a scoop, and it's digging a little trench on the surface. Now, this is a photo taken of the trench just on the day it was dug. And four sols later, so that's four Martian days later, we took another picture. There's not a lot of difference, but I promise you that some of these little bits of white are missing over there. And in this case, yeah, Phoenix was looking just below the surface, and this is the first images we have of subsurface water ice. So we're seeing a little bit of frost actually under the surface of Mars. After that, we've got Curiosity. Now, this is a picture that Curiosity sent back of itself. It's got a camera, it's got on a selfie stick, essentially, so it can take photos of itself and send us a selfie from Mars. Curiosity is a lot bigger than some of the other rovers. Spirit and Opportunity are about my height. Curiosity is the size of a car. You can see it against the man in the lab there, possibly a woman in the lab. It's a very big, very powerful rover driving around on the surface. Since 2012, it's still going today. Curiosity is looking for evidence of past water in Gale Crater. So as Stephen was saying, we've got evidence of rivers. We have uh, a suspicion there was probably an ocean across the top of uh, Mars. We are looking for evidence of that standing water, ide ideally standing water, in Gale Crater. I picked this picture here. If you look at the little cracks on this rock, and then you think about on Earth, where you have a damp surface, maybe clay or mud, as that dries out, you start to get cracks in the surface, which look a little bit like this. So this could be evidence of that sort of environment where Curiosity is driving around today. Another example is this sort of layered rock formation that they saw in a cliff that it drove past. Now, we see a lot of these sort of layered rocks on Earth all the time. We know how they form. We know that you need a body of standing water, something like a lake. So you get particles sedimenting down to the bottom of a lake, building up layers over time. And what's left in the rock record is this sort of strata here. The key point of this is, that needs to, or what that we need for that to happen is a standing body of water over tens of thousands of years. So that water needs to be there a really long time for this sort of formation to occur. And the fact that we've seen the formation on Mars means that we believe there was standing water there for a long period of time. And 
if life was to evolve on Mars, you need those long, steady environments for it to evolve in. So what are we still looking for with these sort of missions to the surface? Well, we're looking for those habit environments, those long-standing environments where life could have arisen. I've got a picture here of some little microbes. Uh, when we find, well, if we find evidence of life on Mars, it won't be uh, plants or it won't be animals. It will more likely be little microbes like this. Whereas on Earth, we can go and dig up dinosaur bones and we can find fossils of uh, previous life. On Mars, we won't be looking for that, but even these little bugs will leave evidence of themselves in the rocks. So we need to know where to look for those uh, fossils of bugs, and then we need to go and find them. We're also looking for clues to the past climate. As we said, it's evident that Mars was different in the past. There was rain, there were probably oceans, but at some points there may also be glaciers moving across mountains. We're still piecing all that together, and we need the evidence from the mineralogy and the rock on the surface to put that story into context. And we are looking at the current active processes. This is my little diagram of a methane molecule. So as Stephen said, we don't understand what the cycle is exactly, what's causing some of the methane. And we need samples from the surface and from the orbiters around Mars to help us fill in the gaps. So what's next when it comes to missions to the surface for Mars? Well, next up is InSight. This, I believe, is launching in 2018. And it's another lander, so it won't be driving across the surface. But the exciting bit about InSight will be putting a seismometer on Mars. So we use seismometers on Earth to measure earthquakes. And we've put seismometers on the moon to measure moonquakes. We haven't done that on Mars yet. And if we put seismometers on the surface of Mars, we'll be able to get more information about the interior of Mars. So we don't really know anything about that. We've got theories, but we haven't got any data yet. So this will be a really exciting mission. After that, we've got Mars 2020, which you might be able to tell it looks a bit like Curiosity. It's going to be quite similar, a little more high-powered, and it's going to go to a different part of the surface. So we'll be able to get comparative samples from similar rovers, again, traveling across the surface, hopefully, quite a, few num uh, quite a number of years. And as Stephen mentioned, we've got ESA's ExoMars rover launching in 2020. This is a little prototype of the rover just driving around a Mars yard. It's not a very big rover, as you can see. I think it might even be a little bit smaller than Spirit and Opportunity. But the crucial point is this rover will have a drill, and not just a drill into the top centimetre or two of the surface. This drill is going to drill two metres down into the surface. That's going to be really exciting, because the top metre or so of the Martian surface has been bombarded for a very long time with that nasty UV radiation. So that's no longer a really good environment where we think life could have survived. But if you go below that top metre, then the surface <laughs> material below that has been protected from the worst of the radiation, so it's more likely to be a potential habitable environment for those microbes that we want to look for, or ex-microbes. Beyond that, beyond that, astronauts on Mars. I don't actually have an answer for this one, but I do think it'll happen. Um, as Stephen said, getting to Mars is quite tricky. Keeping people alive on Mars for the year and a half they've got to stay there before they can possibly come back is going to be tricky as well, and getting them back will be risky. But I definitely think people are going to go. Uh, these are pictures I've just picked off the NASA website, so they're already thinking about it. And the amount of science we could do if we put a person on Mars, if we get a geologist in a spacesuit walking around picking up rocks, is exponential compared to the slow progress we've managed to make with a few rovers. So if we really want to get that science, we want to send a person there. And it's, uh, you know, those of you who are 13 or so, you're going to be the generation who actually get to stand on Mars. So I'm going to leave you with that. If you want some more information, hopefully we've inspired you. There's uh, some links there. And thank you very much.